Young tradey who suffered an electric shock while working at Goodwood last week has sadly died in hospital. 25-year-old Dion Hallion's life support was switched off this afternoon, five days after the tragic accident. He was working on the roof of a King William Road hair and beauty salon when he was electrocuted. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And that Seven News report of a workplace tragedy in Adelaide contained two important errors. First, Dion Hallion was not 25 when he died, he was 29. But second, and more importantly, Dion Hallion was not in fact dead, or not when that 6pm bulletin went to air. His life support machine was switched off at around 7.30pm, well after Seven reported it. Not surprisingly, Dion's family and friends were upset, with one friend, Rosie Everett, taking to Seven's Facebook page to vent her anger. Despite our request to be able to grieve for Dion Hallion's passing and interviewed 24 hours later, you instead chose to release the piece before he was even dead. You broadcast his death before he was dead because you couldn't even fucking wait. So, how did it all go wrong? Well, Seven was speaking to Rosie to arrange an interview with the family, who were keen to pay tribute to Dion on television. But Rosie said 3.30pm on Saturday would not be possible because that's when his life support was due to be cut. Seven took that time as a fact and at 6.35 told its viewers... A young tradie who suffered an electric shock while working at Goodwood last week has sadly died in hospital. Dion's grieving girlfriend, B Moran, discovered Seven's story the following day and was so upset she punched a wall, injuring her hand. I was just so angry. I hadn't even had a chance to process what happened that day. It was so raw and fresh. And to see that, I was just so disappointed and angry. B says some of those close to Dion were forced to learn about his death from Seven. And one of those was his young goddaughter, whose father and Dion's best friend, according to B, wanted to tell her in person. She's young. She's only eight or nine. He wanted to be able to talk about it as a father, and she saw it on the news. To make matters worse, Seven used this old Facebook photo of Dion, not with his girlfriend of three years, but with his ex-wife. So, what does Seven have to say? Well, Adelaide News boss Chris Salter declined to comment, but we understand Seven has now written to the family to apologise, as indeed it should. But now, let's go to America, where Donald Trump, your favourite president, as he dubbed himself last week, appears to have shaken off his dose of COVID-19. I think this was a blessing from God that I caught it. This was a blessing in disguise. Yes, Donald Trump was outside the White House on Wednesday, showing he'd bounced back to health and telling us he'd done so with the help of almost every drug used to target the disease, except for one. Hydroxychloroquine. Try it. If the president asked to be given the drug he called a miracle and a game changer, his doctors clearly told him no, which led some of Trump's supporters to cry foul. Whoever told the president to stop taking HCQ should be punched in the face. How do you prove to the world HCQ works? Perfect opportunity. And it wasn't just in America that Trumpers were hoping it would be used. Back in Australia, Sky's John Ruddick was also backing hydroxychloroquine to help Donald and Melania pull through. Suspect they'll bounce back with strength. And so was Andrew Bolt. But a few weeks earlier on Sky, Bolt was going even further, lauding the drug's life-saving properties and blaming COVID deaths in Australia on, wait for it, the culture wars. One culture war in particular could have just killed hundreds of Australians. Yes, Bolt and Rowan Dean claimed a new US study showed hundreds of Aussies with COVID-19 could be saved by hydroxychloroquine, but hatred of Donald Trump was denying them access to the drug and sentencing them to death. Rowan, um, this is culture war turned deadly. I mean, this could be one that is responsible for hundreds of deaths, particularly in Victoria. Can you explain it to me? Yeah, well, uh, you've already explained it brilliantly, but what I would say here and now, uh, uh, Chief Medical Officer Paul Kelly should be stood down immediately. He should hand in his resignation out of sheer embarrassment. And by the end of their chat, Dean in particular was getting quite worked up. Paul Kelly, Nick Coatesworth and uh, Chris Bowen stand condemned by this study. The jury is in and the jury says categorically hydroxychloroquine saves lives and Australians must be given access to this drug. So what is this groundbreaking study that shows our chief medical officers to be callous killers? Well, if you go to the website of the Palmer Foundation, whose patron Clive Palmer bought 30 million doses of hydroxychloroquine back in April, you'll find the study making headlines. And you'll see 
that its lead author is a Dr Chadwick Prodromos, who, it turns out, is a sports doctor and orthopaedic surgeon from Chicago. Yes, really. And who is a world expert, but on hamstrings, shoulders and cruciate ligaments, and not infectious diseases or COVID-19. Prodromos did not conduct any trials himself. He reviewed 43 done by others and found that most of them show it works. HCQ is effective against COVID-19. His conclusions are at odds with the findings of the University of Oxford's big randomised recovery trial, which was terminated early in June after deciding there was, quote, No clinical benefit from use of hydroxychloroquine in hospitalised patients with COVID-19. And they're also at odds with findings from the WHO's randomised solidarity trial, which was cut short in July for the same reason, that there was no clinical benefit for hospitalised patients. And they're at odds with the conclusions of the US Food and Drug Administration. So, why should we believe Dr Padromas over them? Epidemiologist and blogger Gideon Meravitz katz says we should not, because... Collating the number of studies that are positive and negative is unscientific and essentially meaningless. And his verdict is echoed by the Science Media Centre's Lyndall Byford, who told MediaWatch... The phrase, garbage in, garbage out, means that if a review includes low-quality studies, the results will reflect that and are likely to be biased and unreliable. Paul Glazou, Professor of Evidence-Based Medicine at Bond University, was equally scathing about the Prodromus study, calling it very poor and telling us... The results of this review are not trustworthy, as it uses weak methods to find, select and combine studies and its main conclusions are based mostly on non-randomised trials. And Gideon Merovitz katz points out that in the research Dr Padromos reviews... There is not a single large randomised control trial that supports his position. On the other hand, disagreeing with his position are six well-controlled large RCTs with more than 450 participants each. So, what should we make of the study that Bolt and Dean found so damning? I asked Associate Professor Stephen Tong, who ran the big Australian trial of hydroxychloroquine, to sum it up in one word. And he told me it was, wait for it. Rubbish. <laughs> Is that too strong? <laughs> Professor Tong abandoned his trial of hydroxychloroquine as a COVID treatment back in July. I asked him why. Big trials overseas, uh, these show that hydroxychloroquine basically doesn't work for treatment of COVID. So I asked, is that now agreed by the experts? Correct, and that's reflected by all the major national guidelines around the world, including the WHO guidelines, um, which strongly suggest not to use hydroxychloroquine in such circumstances. So, what does Professor Tong make of Bolt and Dean's claim that denying the drug to people could be killing hundreds of Australians? It's a ridiculous claim, to be honest. Uh, and if anything, um, hydroxychloroquine not only has no benefit, uh, but the signal in all these larger studies is that it might have a, a degree of harm. And finally, I asked why do people like Bolton Dean argue so passionately for this drug when all the evidence is against them? It's a really good question. <laughs> I'm not the right one to answer that, I think. Uh, I, I'd, I'd ask them. Um, it, you know, even, even Donald Trump's not using it for when he gets, uh, when he gets COVID. So I really don't see what, what, why people are holding on to this at this stage. And indeed, we did ask Andrew Bolt, who told us... I do not passionately support hydroxychloroquine. Your bias is showing. I passionately support being fair in reporting the facts. Bolt also says many studies in the past two months have suggested it works. You can read his full reply on our website. Meanwhile, Donald Trump has stopped spruiking hydroxychloroquine. He told the world last week he discovered a new miracle cure. I went in, I wasn't feeling so hot. And within a very short period of time, they gave me Regeneron. It's called Regeneron and other things too, but I think this was the key, but they gave me Regeneron and it was like unbelievable. I felt good immediately. I felt as good three days ago as I do now. There is still one study in Australia into whether taking hydroxychloroquine can help prevent healthcare workers getting COVID-19 in the first place. And the jury is still out on that one. The fact that Trump took the drug back in May for two weeks and later got sick does not prove it doesn't work as a preventative measure. But now, to leaders back home and a political coup in Canberra. Prime Minister Scott Morrison has spent the weekend on the tools, helping out in the backyard. The PM showed us he's as adept with a drill as he is with putting together a trade deal, making a chicken coop for his family. Bottom line, it's a great chicken coop. Well done, <laughs> Prime Minister. Yes, as political PR goes, it doesn't get much better than that. 
So, why was Scott the Builder in the news? Because of this Instagram post on the long weekend from the PM, recounting how Jen and the kids had handed him his riding instructions. The other night, she finally just decided to order a chicken coop online. It was delivered yesterday and my weekend task today was decided. And Nine's Today Show loved it as much as Seven, with hosts Alison Langdon and Carl Stefanovic fawning over the PM in this post-budget interview. And on a lighter note, how good's his handyman skills, yeah. by the way? The chicken coop at the weekend. It's unbelievable. <laughs> it was a bit of fun, um, and the girls are looking forward to naming the chooks. And in now-deleted social media posts, the ABC also indulged the PM, much to the chagrin of many ABC fans. Are you doing a little DIY this long weekend? Prime Minister Scott Morrison, SCOMO, has been busy constructing a chicken coop. But as you'd know, this isn't the first PM marketing campaign the media has lapped up. Three weeks ago, SCOMO was stealing the limelight with Hope the Wombat. On a lighter note, after making the gas announcement in Newcastle today, the Prime Minister dropped into a reptile park on the way home. Uh, he got to hold some of the residents, including a wombat called Hope. Uh, he was actually there to talk about JobKeeper, but that was somewhat overshadowed by the animals. Davina? <laughs> Very cute. He's big on the wombat wobble, I hear. Yes, who wants to focus on the JobKeeper program when you can have a cute furry animal instead? And the week before that, it was ScoMo's cubby house on Father's Day. Well, it's been a busy period for the Prime Minister. He has managed to spend some quality time with his 11-year-old daughter, Lily. The pair built a cubby house called Kittabilly House as part of a school passion project. We've been to Bunnies and we've got all the wood and the hammers and we're all ready to go. So why are ScoMo's image softeners in overdrive? No doubt because it helps keep him popular and distract from grim news like this. Record debt, record deficit, record low economic growth, record business failure. But does everyone need to fall for it? As Pedestrian wrote last week in a swipe at the media... Ordinarily, positioning a Prime Minister like that should be an excruciatingly hard job. But with a media class so happy to fall face first across every crumb tossed out, it's as easy as building a chicken coop. Keep watching, there'll surely be more to come. And finally, to a new start for Australia's largest magazine group, which has ditched the name Bauer after the German company sold out in June and rebranded itself as R Media, which stands for Audience, Reach and Engagement. Snappy stuff. And with a new name comes a shiny new pitch promising readers will be captivated. Well, they'll need to be, given Bauer's disastrous eight-year foray into the local market cost around half a billion dollars. But CEO Brendan Hill and new owners Mercury Capital are promising a break from the past. With new ownership and a new identity comes a refreshed and reinvigorated focus. And that is music to our ears because in June we implored Mercury Capital to stop the lies and deceit that some of its biggest selling mags serve up, like making up quotes and sources and manipulating photos and images to create a scoop. So, how are New Idea and Women's Day living up to the promise? Well, on the same day that our media was launched, New Idea had breaking news from Hollywood. Shiloh tells. Jen's my new stepmom. The photo of Jennifer Anston with Brad Pitt's daughter Shiloh was also splashed inside the magazine. And don't they look cosy. But it's a fake. In the original, Jen has her arm around actor Courtney Cox at an event back in November, as you can see here. And Shiloh is actually being hugged by her mum, Angelina Jolie in October last year. But with a bit of cut and paste, they can be made to embrace for new idea. Clever, eh? Meanwhile, at Stablemate Woman's Day, there's another Jen exclusive. Brad and Jen's secret ceremony. But it's a fake again. Jen is actually snuggling up with actor Billy Crudup in January at the Screen Actors Guild Awards, while Brad is alone after winning his award. Brought together by Woman's Day in another lie. But why stop there? This world exclusive that Megan's pregnant again is a photo from February last year, just before she had Archie. It's not a new snap of her looking pregnant. Incredible, eh? But as Media Watch viewers would know, it's nothing out of the ordinary for these rags. Back in June, when the ink was still fresh on Mercury's deal to buy the Bauer Empire, we asked if editors would now have more respect for facts and honesty. And we were told... We're unable to comment on behalf of Mercury Capital. Well, now we know the answer, and it's clearly no. So, will readers be captivated by more of the magazine's cheating and lies? I reckon the answer is no as well. 
That's all from us tonight. There's more on our website where you can read that statement from Andrew Bolt. And don't forget, Media Bytes every Thursday on your favourite social media platform. But for now, until next week, goodbye. <laughs>